and take it away, Dan. <laughs> All right. Um, howdy, everybody. I am Daniel Ressler. I am uh, the uh, speaker for tonight, and my topic is, did I actually vote for my candidate? So um, a little bit of background on me. Um, oh. I am, uh, a high, I wouldn't say highly involved, but moderately involved in several civic tech projects. Um, first and foremost, I'm a member of the League of Women Voters, and I um, have experience putting, oh, did I stop sharing? Uh, yeah, stop sharing. Screen. Yeah, you know, it's, it is what it is. The, the tech never, the tech is always okay. on. I'm back. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So uh, I'm a volunteer for the League of Women Voters, and specifically, I help uh, contact candidates and get them to fill out their profiles for both Vote411.org, which is the um, voter guide online service, um, as well as VotersEdge.org, which is the California-based service as well, um, helping kind of put that together. Um, the next thing, Kevin. Can you mute, please? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I, I, I tell someone to mute. And then no I worries. Forget to mute. My bad. Sorry. Uh, uh, so the next thing that I uh, that I help out with or, or participate in is an organization called Open Austin, which is a civic tech meetup. Um, they actually have a meetup tomorrow night, so shameless plug for that. Um, but I'm a project lead for several uh, voting-focused projects, um, one of them which is a database for and an API for all ballots in the country called Ballot API. And the next one is a voter registration web browser plugin where you can monitor your voter registration to see if it has been purged called Purge Alert. Um, I'm also in, if you are not familiar with Texas, in order to help somebody register to vote, you actually have to be deputized as a voter deputy registrar by your county. And so I have gone through that, thanks to the League of Women Voters who really help people um, get through that. And then as far as the tech and cybersecurity side, I also have a fair number of uh, cybersecurity side projects that are mainly focused on encryption for HTTPS and, uh, and uh, encryption, web encryption. So uh, it's talking about uh, crypto in the sense of security, not crypto in the sense of coins. So anyway, so that's a little bit of my background. So I've been, I'm a huge nerd for voting and security and technology and civic stuff. And so I really, really love to dive into that, which is why I'm going to take you down the rabbit hole tonight of uh, exactly how I verified my own vote on the new voting systems. So if you have been in Travis County or in Austin for many years, you will probably recognize these machines. These are the Heart E Slate machines. Um, these are the voting systems that we used to have. It's basically a tablet with a little spinner wheel and some buttons at the bottom. And your ballot would show up on it and you would scroll around and select your selections and then click or push the cast ballot button and your vote would magically be cast. And so this is what is called a direct recording electronic voting system, which means that um, basically it's fully electronic. You vote on the machine, the vote gets stored on the machine itself, and there is no paper trail. It's just stored in memory. And then the votes are uh, tabulated by just plugging the memory sticks into the central recorder. And so that is the system that we used to have. And that was the system that encouraged people to, to use. Obviously, uh, I, I, for uh, obviously that has a lot of problems, meaning that there's no paper trail. And so, when it came time to uh, replace those systems, we ended up actually switching to what is called a hybrid system. And the system that we switched to is by a company called Election Serv Election Systems and Software, I believe, ESNS. Um, their website's called S-Vote. Everybody calls them S-Vote. Um, but they have a machine called the Express Vote, and that is what is called a hybrid machine. And the hybrid machine is basically a thing where you still input your votes electronically, which means that you still have a touch screen where you tap on it and you select your things, but it prints them out on a paper ballot. You insert a blank ballot, you select, make your selections, 
and then it will print out your selections on this paper ballot, and then you walk that printed out ballot over to a scanner, and you feed it in, and it goes into a safety bin um, that keeps the paper backups and then counts the votes off of the scanner. And so that's great because, hooray, we have a paper trail. Woo, paper trail, everybody celebrate. Yeah, so this is uh, something that we have been wanting for a very, very long time in Texas. And a lot of the major cities in Texas are now moving to the hybrid systems. So I think Houston um, has a hybrid system. Uh, I'm not sure the other ones. I think Dallas and Tarrant County, Dallas and Fort Worth might. Austin definitely does now. Um, San Antonio, I think, does as well. So some of the major places have been replacing their old um, uh, DRE systems, the, the, the electronic only systems with the hybrid systems. So that's great. Hooray, we have a paper trail. So let's take a look at what the actual ballot looks like. All right, so this is on the far left is a, it's a long strip of paper and you're you slide it in the machine and then it prints out and this is what the printout looks like and the reason that so it's a long strip of paper and so if we zoom into the top of the paper you'll see that there is a section up top for the ballot type and then there's a section for the vote barcodes and then there's a section for the vote uh human readable uh section okay but when i saw that i was like wait what Vote barcodes, what the hell are those things? Like, this is something that I totally did not expect to be on a printed out ballot that I was, was supposed to be reviewing. And so I'm like, I, I need to figure out what these are. And when I, when I looked at the system and the way it worked, and when I reached out to the, to the Travis County clerk and to the vendor, um, I realized that the barcodes are actually the thing that the scanner reads and not the human readable section. And so the, the scanner reads the barcodes and not the human readable section. And therefore, the barcodes are your real votes. They're the things that actually get counted. And so if you actually want to verify who you voted for, you need to read, you need to learn to read barcodes. And so that's when I started entering matrix territory where I was, oh my God, I'm starting to have to read the code. And so what I'm about to do, I'm, I'm putting a warning in here because we are about to go the rabbit, down the rabbit hole into the barcodes, okay? And so that's what this talk is about. And I'm gonna take you on this journey of how I actually did this, okay? So first off, what are barcodes? Barcodes look like this, we see them everywhere. And barcodes are basically nothing more than just binary, okay? A one is a dark line, a bar, and a zero is a space. And you can subdivide up barcodes into segments, and the wider the bar is, the more ones there are, and the wider the spaces are, the more zeros there are, okay? And so in here, you probably can't see it because the picture's probably fuzzy, I have taken a barcode and I have subdivided it up into um, the ones and zeros, and I've strung all of those out on the bottom. And the second thing you need to know about barcodes, specifically these types of barcodes um, that are used in the election system, is that there is a uh, there are 11 bits to every character. And so if you know anything about uh, binary, uh, usually there are eight bits in barcodes. There are eleven bits, which means that there are eleven ones and zeros per section. And the first uh, bit, or the first one or zero, or the first section of a character is always a black bar, and the end is always a uh, space. Okay. Um, the exception to that is the end code, where there's it ends with two black bars, but that's not relevant. We are we don't have to worry about that, but that's generally the way that the that barcodes are encoded. And so, if you combine those ones and zeros up, there is a start code, so some sort of signif signification of what um, what you're encoding. And then there's characters, and then so in this case, this barcodes is a wiki, is is what it spells out in characters. And then there's the checksum, and then there's the in the stop code. Okay. 
And so that's what a barcode reads to. And I, the reason why I'm going through all of this will become very, very relevant later. And the reason why I can't use a, just a barcode scanner will become relevant later. So stick with me. We are going down a rabbit hole. OK, so now how do you actually look up what those, uh, what those ones and zeros actually mean? So say you've decoded a barcode into a set of characters. All right. How do you actually know that it translates to a W and an I and a K and an I? Well, you look it up in a table. And luckily, Wikipedia has a table of all of the various characters. And so you can see on the right here of this table, like the patterns. Remember, those are the 11 bits. And you just can match up the ones and zeros, right? And so what's important, though, is that in this particular type of, it's called code 128, is the type that's used in the election system. The start code signifies what type of character you need to look up. And so there are three types of start codes um, that are different patterns. The very first character that you read can be one of three different patterns. And then those correspond to what characters you actually need to look up. And so that'll become important later as well. So, OK, I'm going to pause there. And actually, no, I have one more thing, one more thing. So the other thing to note about this table is that you can actually shorten the ones and zeros. You don't have to write down ones and zeros. What you can do is you can basically create a shorthand notation that describes how wide the bars are or how wide the spaces are. And so if I have um, this, this set of ones and zeros for this, for this barcode, I know that it's one wide bar, three wide space, one wide bar, two wide space, two wide bar, two wide space. And I can note that by just saying one, three, one, two, 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 right? Because I know I'm alternating bars and spaces. And so that is how, in general, you see a lot of barcodes encoded is in this sort of width notation or shorthand notation, OK? All right, now let's go back to the balance. So, that ballot that I had earlier, let's actually take a look at one of the barcodes themselves. So here is the first you know, short barcode on the left. And what I've done here is I've actually written down the shorthand. So it's a two wide, a one wide space, a one wide bar, blah, 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 right? And so when you, when you spend a little bit of time with this, you actually can start writing this down fairly quickly because you can just kind of eyeball the bars and the spaces and write them down. And the cool thing about that is if you go across, there's you'll always end on a set of numbers adding up to 11. And so those are your characters. And so if I go down and I write down those characters, I can go back to that Wikipedia table and look up what exactly those characters were. And so I can say, OK, that, that's the start code C. So I know what column to look it up. And then I have three characters, and then a checksum, and then a stop code. Okay, and those characters translate to O nine one two one one. Okay, that is what is on your ballot that gets read by the computer, and that is the thing that actually casts your vote. And so I'm like, what the hell does that mean? What what can that possibly mean? Those codes. And so now now we're going deeper into the rabbit hole. Okay. All right, let's talk about absentee, absentee ballots. So absentee ballots are something that are pretty much universal, and you have to have them for everybody who can't go vote in person. Um, so in Texas, and I'm sure we'll get into the discussion of this later, currently in Texas, you can only request an absentee ballot if you're over 65, if you are uh, not in the county during the entire duration of the early voting and election day, or you're disabled. And so I think there's another one, Cindy. Correct me if I'm wrong. You're you're muted if you're talking. Did, uh, if you're in jail but otherwise able to vote. Did you okay. get that? Gotcha. Yes. Uh, if you're in jail. So that's the other that's the other exception. So anyway, this is the sort of thing that you get, and the county has to produce it no matter what, anyway. All right. So what's cool about that is there's a grid on the side of this absentee ballot. Uh, and so that was one of the things that was pointed out by the vendor. And so if I take my barcodes and I start looking at this grid, 
And I say, oh, if I do nine down, that lines up with all of the selections. And then after I do 12 across, and then if I have the page number and the side number as those last two characters, I can coordinate, I can like get the coordinates of an actual vote on the absentee ballot. And so what your barcodes actually correspond to as the coordinates on the absentee ballot and the page and the side number. And so that's what you're looking at when you're looking at the uh, looking at the looking at the printed ballot from the machine for those barcodes. Yay, we did it. We figured it out. Hooray. We did a great job. So we figured out how what those barcodes mean. And one of the cool things that I have found about this barcode uh, encoding structure is that you don't actually need a mapping table. All you have to have in order to reverse engineer your barcodes on your ballots whenever you need to do a recount or whenever you need to audit something, all you have to have is a copy of your absentee ballot or the absentee ballot for that precinct. So you don't necessarily need to keep some other piece of information around that maps encoding numbers to, to uh, who the candidate or what candidates you voted for. It's an encoding system itself by using the coordinates of the absentee ballot. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, on how to do it. So to recap, the barcodes on your ballot are what gets counted by the scanner, not the human readable section, okay? So when they tell you to look over your human readable section, like that's nice and all, but that's not what the scanner actually reads. And second, the barcode values correspond to the coordinates of that section um, on of that selection on the absentee ballot, okay? So how do I translate this into something that's actually useful? So now I have the knowledge. Now I understand what the hell's going on. Uh, there's an election coming up. How do I actually verify who I voted for? So the key thing is, and the reason why I went through how to like read a barcode to start, is that you're not allowed to bring any electronics into the polling location. You're supposed to turn your phone off. You're supposed to like silence all your stuff. You can't. I can't bring in a barcode scanner. I can't bring in my phone and have an app on it that can scan the barcodes. And so like, I can't actually read the barcodes while I'm in the voting booth, but you can bring in paper and pencil. Like you can bring in, like that's why we, why I love printing out the voter guide from the league uh, whenever, whenever I go vote is because I can actually like take that physical thing in with me and reference it when I'm voting to make sure that I've, you know, chosen the right, right selections. And so my strategy, my election day strategy that I came up with was first, I'm going to bring a barcode scan cheat sheet and a pen. I'm going to vote on the machine to make my selections. I'm going to print out the filled out ballot. So now I have that print out filled out ballot. I'm gonna verify that the human readable section is correct, right? That I made the correct selections in the human readable section. And then I'm gonna copy down the bar barcodes using that shorthand notation. And then I'm gonna to walk to the scanner and scan the ballot to vote. And then I'm gonna go home with the written down barcodes. I'm gonna look up the absentee ballot for my precinct. I'm gonna decode the barcodes into coordinates. And then I'm going to verify the coordinates actually match the correct selections on the absentee ballot. And then I'm going to give a talk about it to make it all worth it. So that is my election day plan. And so this is the actual cheat sheet that I took in with me to the primary, right? So I had the, the, the table that I showed you earlier for decoding the codes, which I, you know, you obviously can't read. And then some uh, notations just for, for reference on, say, Wikipedia as a barcode, that sort of thing. And then I wrote down one of the barcodes from my printed out ballot using that shorthand notation. And so this is very similar to what you saw earlier, what we saw us earlier do is, you know, you see the things they add up to 11 and the little tick marks there um, after each several characters is the, the character, after each number is the character delimiters. And so that translates into the start code C, position of nine, position of nine, page one, side one, and then to check sum and the stop code. Okay? 
So that's what I copied down from the ballot box before I voted. And so now I have to figure out who that, who that selection actually was on the absentee ballot. And so this is my precinct's absentee ballot. And you can just go to the Travis County website and download your sample ballot um, before the election. And you can get this, uh, this sort of absentee ballot. And so let's actually do the coordinates. So I had column one or column nine, row nine, page one, side one. Okay. So obviously column nine uh, was the uh, was the selection rows for all the bubbles. And then row nine was Elizabeth Warren as a selection. So I actually manually verified that I voted for Elizabeth Warren from the scanned barcodes on the absentee ballot. And so, yes, I actually manually verified my vote. It's amazing. I actually like accomplished this. This was a huge moment for me when I actually was able to verify the barcodes and I notated everything down. So I, I was really, really excited. So hooray, high fives all around. Um, okay, so not everybody can do this. Like this process really sucked. It was only somebody who would vote for Warren that would do this. So this is one of those things where I like, where do we go from here? So uh, where I think we can go from here is uh, I think that it's possible, like when you have the absentee ballot, in theory, you can write down the coordinates of all of the selections and generate barcodes based on those coordinates. And so in theory, you could create a booklet or some sort of a tool where you could print out a cheat sheet that would have all of the barcode, possible barcodes that you want on them. And so I think one of the next steps is to create an open source tool that allows you to generate a barcode reference that you can pre-print out and then take into the voting booth with you. So you don't have to learn the shorthand notation. You don't have to write anything down. You don't have to do anything like that. But it's like a good sanity or spot check to say, OK, I want to make sure that this selection that I have is, you know, matches what I have on my little binder or printout. So. That's where I think it can go from here, there. I think it's uh, open to open to suggestions on it. Um, I'm also open to anybody who wants to take this over. I don't know that I'm necessarily going to be the biggest thing because I have already proven to myself that it's possible. And so if anybody wants to take over the project, um, I'm also very curious to hear feedback on what we should name the damn thing. Um, I, I don't really know what to name it. I think it should be kind of fun or clever or I don't know. Uh, I'm open to suggestions on that as well. So anyway, that's the that's the journey I have had on on going through from, hey, what are these things to actually implementing something for election day to actually verifying my vote. So I hope that you enjoyed that that little story and and enjoyed learning a little bit about barcodes. So yeah, uh, Kevin, do you have any? I, I feel like like the latest topic is all of the absentee ballot stuff and whether or not you can tick the uh, disability box if you want to request an absentee ballot and the fact that they just changed the voting dates and all that sort of stuff. I feel like that's much more of a topic at hand for discussion, but happy to answer I questions mean, on this on this process as well. I, I mean, I, I think everything's fair game, and I'll just say, well, yeah, br bravo, Daniel. That was uh, some wonderful nerd detective uh, work on your part. That uh, <laughs> it was quite fascinating. Um, yes, and I, I, I that, and frankly, you would, as soon as you were like, oh, and the dotted lines on the absentee ballot actually encode a hidden message. I'm like, dang, you, you make me want to go all tinfoil here. There's hidden messages everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, that was quite wonderful. Um, yeah, I guess like so. I'm I'm finding myself curious. Like, so I you know I, I as a programmer totally get why the human readable part doesn't do anything because writing the whole system to somehow read that is way more error prone than the nice simple elegance of the barcode. I guess like I'm just trying to think like so. I get a lot of the rules around what you can and can't take in the voting booth for various things. I'm just, I don't know, like, it seems, I'm just wondering, like, a way to, I really applaud this, like, verification that the machine got it right. I'm just trying to think, like, if there's some 
easier way to do it that wouldn't run afoul of like the laws around what you can and can't bring into the booth. I, I mean, and you know, the open source tool you talk about would be a part of it, but but at the same time, just like as you point out, I'm like, is there some way that we could have the ease of the human readable system with the design requirements of the barcodes? Because as you pointed out, like going to this effort for you to decode this was like peculiar. <laughs> yeah. No, it was definitely a uh, project of passion, not a project of ease. That's for sure. So yeah, I, I, I might have given up halfway along the way. I'm glad you uh, stuck with it. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, yeah. My I dog guess, is. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I guess uh, before we potentially pivot to other things, and you know, uh, we have the room for two hours, but you know, I, I always say the meetups are as long as uh, whatever works for the topic right. at hand but i think we can all keep talking for a while but uh before we potentially change topics i guess uh does anybody have questions for daniel on what he uncovered there uh, is anybody confused on part of it as a programmer it all seems fairly straightforward to me but i realize yeah. we have lots of people from lots of different backgrounds in here so does anybody have questions for daniel about how the hell this whole thing works from a technical perspective I went through it really fast, so I can totally go through parts of it again if people need to. And for those of you who uh, are new to WebEx and new to this virtual conferencing, uh, you should see a little mic icon over your name. Uh, if you click on that, it should unmute you. So uh, that's what you need to do if you want to chime up and uh, be heard. So any questions? I had a suggestion. Uh, yeah. uh, in terms of making this information actually usable, if somebody who, let's say, had a connection to the League of Women Voters used this program to generate the reference codes in advance, they could put it in the back page of the League Guide. And that way you could not only take, take that to the ballot box and use it to remind you who you should vote for, but also to confirm your vote after you were. Yes, so that's actually part of the, like I have not written that software yet and I'm definitely open to others writing it um, instead of me. Now that I've kind of like figured out how to do it. Go ahead. One issue with that is because of all the different precincts, each of those ballots for every yeah. precinct is, I'm going to use the word, unique. And so that would be, uh, that would be difficult to do because it's precinct specific and there. Yeah, no. So. Yes. So well, I was thinking actually, more of, uh, I was thinking more of in the terms of like a vote 411 or a software website where you'd be able to kind of like put in your precinct or look up your address and it would ha generate kind of on the fly because it's not actually that much data. It's three characters per, per barcode. And so it's totally possible to be able to do that um, without, uh, without causing too much stress on servers or anything like that. It's totally possible to generate barcodes on the fly. Um, and so if you're able to just have like a database of the coordinates um, for each precinct ballot, yes, like the, the hardest part of that project would totally be creating the database in the first place, like creating the data set in the first place, not the actual generation of the barcodes for the pre-printouts. Well, there's there's an easy solution to, to that too. If this tool existed and was open source, you could uh, encourage either county clerks to include it on the back of the ballot paper or the voting machine company to actually print it out. But then that would imply that you're trusting them to print it correctly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That I think that the open source tool that's independent of the vendor is probably the way to go, um, or at least that's the way that I would I would kind of consider using it. Uh, I think crowdsourcing the inputting of the ballot things like one of the major issues with with this system or or putting together a project like that is turnaround time because the actual uh, sample ballots that I show. Uh, somewhere, 
So the actual sample ballot itself is not made available until like maybe four weeks before the election, just because it's still in the process of being canceled out for, you know, like lower level elections. There may be changes or something like that or challenges. And so the final ballot that actually uh, is referenced or encoded, um, you basically have, I think, how many counties or how many precincts are there in Travis County? Anybody know off the top of their head? 400 or 200 or? Well, I could get you the exact number if you'd let me go check uh, some software and I could come back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I yeah. don't have it off the top so, of my head. <laughs> it's, hundred, it's multiple hundreds. And so. It, and it, I can tell you it's a lot. A district is a very small division of a precinct. There's a lot of them in a single precinct. Yes. So like there are multiple ballot styles per precinct for per precinct. many precincts. And so, yeah, yeah. And so you can actually have more than the number of precincts in absentee ballot styles that you have to build a database for. And so you're talking about um, like, for example, in this primary election, there were, I think, four pages of selections. And so, like, when you're talking about 40 races, in, including all the judge races that you have to vote for, um, that database gets pretty big as far as the coordinate system for it. And so, um, I think that, yes, absolutely, that's totally a project that I want to do. I want to call it by a funny name to make the crowdsourcing less tedious, um, but I don't know how I, like, this is, I wanted to present my findings and solicit help from others because I don't know that I'll be able to do this all myself. So, well, yeah. I'm, I'm happy you uh, brought it here to the community. And, and, and even if nothing comes out of the discussion tonight, Daniel, um, I'm happy to follow up with you and see if we can make more happen on this in some way. Um, one thing yeah, also- Like I if Civitech wants to take over, it'd be great. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I can bring it up to you. Know, who knows? It, it's certainly nerdy enough. It might interest the boss man. <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah. but um, I also just find myself thinking to myself, you know, it'd be really nice to figure out a way that you could get this to the point that an ordinary voter could know their barcode is wrong when it's printed out and before they scanned it. Because once your vote gets recorded, it's great if after the fact you can go back and say, I know my vote was misrecorded and here's the proof, but it, your odds of actually something getting done about it don't seem great to me. It'd really be great if we could figure out a way not running afoul of the rules around what you can and can't bring into the voting booth, which those rules are important, they're there for a reason, of like flagging it at the moment that there's a problem. Yeah, so just to I'm clarify. Actually, I'm sorry, I'm actually concerned about the coding before we even get to the to the to the voting booth. I mean the idea that they're off by you know, they're off by a column, they're off by a row, and you know, you even have no idea that you think the barcode matches what you did, but the original coding is incorrect. I mean, I, it is right. possible that, like, the, yes, the machine was not encoded with the same grid system as the actual ballot, so you may just by coincidence think it recorded you correctly, but maybe it didn't, you know. You, I mean, you're right. It, it's not a... Oh, that, that is... That is highly unlikely um, for a couple of different reasons. So the first reason is that big old fat barcode at the top there. Um, that is actually the uh, the ballot type information. So it's your ballot style, all that sort of stuff, like your precinct. Um, it is not your name. So one of the key requirements of ballots is they cannot be I, traced back to an individual, right? So you, sh you will not be able to go back and say, hey, you need to get rid of my vote because I like wasn't able to decode it correctly. They have no idea which piece of paper was yours. Because right, there's nothing actually, identifying on your ballot. We, it, we don't want them to know it was yeah. you. That's actually really important. Exactly. They don't, that's, that's a very important thing. So that big old fat barcode at the top does not contain any identifying information about you, but it does contain your ballot style. 
it's, it's basically like what the election is and the ballot style that was given. So in my case, it was precinct 242A. Um, and, and so that's what's encoded in the top. And the other thing to remember about barcodes is they have this thing on them. Uh, if I can go down to it, that is called a checksum. And so that checksum actually is a formula that will uh, take the start code through the checksum. And if you add it up and take it by a modulus of some number, I think 103 in this case, um, it will result in that checksum. And so if you have a bar misplaced, it will not read because that checksum will not pass. No, but so, what if they code, code do all the coding and then change the ballot, or they or if they ah. pre, a pre version and they map it on a mistaken, yes. I'll call it absentee ballot. Yes. So, like for example, if the scanner machine has an old coordinate system after they change the absentee ballot or before they change the absentee ballot and the new system has the new coordinate system, you're right. They would not match and the scanner would read the wrong coordinate for the wrong position. That is totally possible. I would say that that's a procedural protection that you would need to put in place. Like you would need to have a procedural control to ensure that that doesn't happen. So the first thing you do whenever you set up the machines is to verify that the version of the coordinate system that you put on the scanner is the same as what you have on the voting machines. I'm sure, I can't imagine that that's not a part of the setup for the daily procedures. I would really hope. And, and I'm glad you went into the checksum part for those who are not as familiar with what uh, checksums are. And, and I guess also I'll just, I'll take this little sidebar to wax a little philosophic, but you know, I'll, I'll just point out that like, um, there is no way in a country of 300 million people that we can devise a system that absolutely guarantees that every one of our votes was recorded accurately. Well, we can continue to try to get closer and closer to that ideal, but as you as you just pointed out, there's a scenario where even with this barcode verification, there's still a point of failure. So, you know, is a KG a vote going to get recorded wrong? I mean, yes, it just is how it is. I mean, we could go back to a system of 100 Whoa. people and everybody doing it by voice vote, and somebody might still accidentally mark one wrong. So there will, it's, if the goal is get to zero Whoa. errors, period, I don't think we're ever going to get to that point. The, Can I jump in for the some thing about these is that, yeah, go ahead. I don't want to delay your explanation to that answer, but when you're finished, can I? Sure. Ask some questions. Yes. So, of course. Yeah. The failure mode that we were talking about, where you have a misprogrammed scanner or a misprogrammed machine, um, that would not necessarily result in one or two votes failing or or being misrecorded. That would result in everybody who is there on that certain ballot style being misrecorded. And so in theory, you would be able to recognize that very clearly if you had a precinct where like everybody, like 90% of the people, if Biden was just right next to Tulsi Gabbard and 90% <laughs> of the candidate, or like 65% of the voters there voted for Tulsi and you know 2% voted for um, Tulsi Gabbard and every other precinct in the surrounding neighborhood was completely the opposite. That would obviously raise some alarms. So you're, the, you're the right. failure There's... mode that you're talking about would be pretty extreme and pretty easily recognizable. I don't know that there's a corrective action that you could actually take. That's what we saw in Florida in 2000. Like if there is confusion and somebody votes for the wrong candidate because they're confused, that vote still counts for that candidate. You can't throw it out because there's no way to tell if that can that person was actually confused or not. So, like that is a bad failure mode, but it is a very recognizable failure mode. Sorry. Okay, Cindy. So I know yes. that uh, each of the counties are required to publicly offer the uh, observation of their logic and accuracy test. Do you know if this is part of that now for those systems who are using this equipment? 
Uh, they invite the public, the media, to come in and watch them as they do this logic and accuracy. I've never gone, so I don't know if barcodes mm. are part of that, but possibly. I don't know. Um, I can't imagine that manually verifying a barcode like I just did is part of that logic and accuracy test because the good thing about logic and accuracy tests is you can actually have electronics in in there with you. So you can just have a barcode scanner with you to read the barcodes. You don't have to manually transpose it like I did because I had to manually transpose it because I went into the booth. Mm -hmm. Have so, you, in your research, did you find any evidence that there have been in, invalid barcode reading? No. Elections? Uh, Is this your personal interest? There was no, you weren't following just, up on any reports? This is purely me wanting to actually verify who I voted for after I saw the barcodes. I was like, that is now a fun thing to figure out. <laughs> I, I, this, well, I, once again, I, I haven't heard any way, one way or the other about inaccurate reading of barcodes. I can give you a little insight as somebody for a past job who wrote code that interpreted a barcode through a computer driver, I can tell you, you absolutely can write bad code that does not read that barcode correctly. So it's certainly possible, but I don't know. I'm sure, but also speaking from that experience, there's probably extreme audit measures in place. So I would expect it would probably be caught pretty quickly. I mean, they were able to last for the purely electronic heart eat slates forever. So I don't know that I grant them that much. <laughs> uh, I may be biased by that. My team, uh, there were extreme audit measures in place. Um, and I'd, I'd also okay. just want to add a sidebar saying that to uh, to Daniel's point as well about like that, that, you know, to go away from my philosophical fatalism at the same time. There are plenty of ways to detect egregious errors pretty easily, as Daniel pointed out. Um, specifically, like when you sometimes see people alleging like, oh, well, these election machines, clearly somebody hacked them, they're rigged, you know, because clearly my candidate would have won and my candidate didn't win. It's like, well, there's great ways to know if there's something fishy, like looking at things like exit polls and and seeing if there was some extreme insane variation that can't be explained. And most of the time, it can be explained, and people mm -hmm. just are in shock that anybody could not vote for their candidate because it's obvious. <laughs> I think it's great to have the spot audience to give some confidence, but I hope that this doesn't become prevalent because this is, in, especially in November, this is going to be the longest ballot you have seen in forever because it's also all the local elections that got moved to November, all of them, mm -hmm. and. Uh, it's also the first time we haven't had straight party voting and straight ticket voting. And this is going to be a, a very long, time-consuming ballot. If if everybody was checking their barcodes, I think we'd have a big problem. Yeah. No, no, no. So, like, I want to be clear. I am not advocating that everybody should check their barcodes. I am just saying that people who want to can take mm -hmm. this presentation and like use it as a starting point for them creating their own system for doing that. Like this is like purely me wanting to sanity check the audits. So what what also happens as part of the pre and post election audits is they manually read the human readable section of these ballots and then scan it through and manually verify that the machine, the scanner, read the barcodes correctly for this particular uh, human readable section. So they do pre and post or spot check the machines and the printers to correctly print the human readable section. I wanted to double check that this is purely it's not that i didn't trust them it's that i wanted to double check and to see if it was possible to double check and i found that it was possible and that i was able to double check it and so that's the uh that's the that's well, the point I of this some of you out there doing those spot checks and talking about it you know i think that we have got a real issue with 
reliability in the system. And everything that we can point to that gives it credibility is another person that may vote. So, uh, so I'm just really, really happy there's a paper trail. Because like none of this would be possible yeah, if we yeah. did not have a paper trail. Like barcodes yes, are not necessarily uh, ideal. Like maybe a Scantron sort of thing where you could actually like see the bubbles bubbled in for you or I don't know, whatever. But like so but barcodes are way better than what we had before. <laughs> Question. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, um, the fact that there actually is a non-digital paper trail backup. I mean, we, we, the EFF community is ecstatic about that because computers are so easy to hack. <laughs> and um, and yeah, it's um, I speak as a programmer. I know why they went with barcodes. Um, I also agree that I don't know if it's necessarily the best solution. I will tell you that like. Doing, doing something like trying to read the human readable portion with an optical character recognizer is a terrible idea. It would be so prone to not reading it correctly that you'd probably get a lot of misrecorded votes. That's why they didn't go with that route. It'd have to be some kind of simplified encoding compared to human readable text. But I agree, it seems like there should be some middle ground between a machine can easily and accurately record it, but it's a little more readable for a human being than a barcode. I'd like to, yeah, potentially have people brainstorm, yeah, better idea than the barcode for this problem. I have a question. Yeah. I was afraid that I was muted for a moment. Uh, if self auditing were more wide, and I know that you said the idea is not for every single person to do this kind of validation, but just if it's more widespread, what do you think, Daniel, are the biggest risk or risks to this? Like, is it a technological risk or like there's is there something logistical that could creep out of the woodwork or political or whatever, what have you? Uh, so you're saying if more people did this, what would the bad things be? Yeah. What do you think the bad things are? Time, would? lag, like... We already saw in the primaries a huge amount of lag at uh, or lines or backups at voting uh, locations that didn't previously um, have uh, long lines. And that's just because it was a new system and people didn't understand how to use it. Like you would have people like vote on the machine and print out the ballot and think that's a that's a receipt and walk out. And you'd be like, oh, no, no, you got to go scan it in here. It's like a two-step thing now. Um, and so, like, it's confusion. And, and I would say it's just the amount of time it took me. I definitely spent more time than I usually spend um, when I, like, wrote down my stuff. And so if a lot of people did that, it would, like, it took me a lot of time to write that little scrimmage thing down, the shorthand down, right? And so. That's the downside is it just would take a long time if a lot of people were doing this. I mean, maybe that's what you want. You want a denial of service attack, your polling location, train a lot of people to do this, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, and if they missed a number when they wrote it down, that could also create an issue. You were probably yes, very so, high, but if they're yeah, rushing and miss one or two digits, that screws the whole system. I have another concern, and Cindy, you know me, Daniel, you you know you know me. I'm not a conspiracy type of person, um, but if you see, if you watch the movie Man of the Year, um, it's really kind of funny because it's Robin Williams is a comedian who decides just for fun to run for president, and Laura Linney works for and is the quality control person for a voting equipment manufacturer. And she finds there's a bug in the voting equipment, not in, not at the other end, but at the voting equipment end. And she finds a, a you know, a mis that there's a mistake in the software that is generating those bar, generating, sorry, not generating, but it turns the coordinates into the barcode. And um, so anyway, it's kind of a very interesting movie to watch just to think about. Yeah, it's a. Uh, I think that anytime you start to introduce encoding or translating coordinates or anything like that, there is an element of risk. 
Barcodes are super fast to read, though. And so you can, if you need to do a recount, you can feed all of the ballots that you have into scanners and recount them really fast. And that's why I think the trade-off was made to use the barcodes instead of something else that may have been slower, like optical character recognition or something like that, because the scanners are super fast. Okay, so I do want to throw in a couple of tidbits that I learned along the way. Uh, the first tidbit is I learned that the scanners are double-sided. So you can scan your ballot upside down if you don't want the person standing beside it to see the human readable section. So you can just flip it over and scan it and it'll still count. Um, so that's cool. Uh, the next thing that I learned is that there are only four vendors. No, now three vendor, three vendors who are certified to provide voting machines in Texas. Well, that's fun. One of them is still Diebold. Um, so that's a fun one. Uh, what else did I learn? Uh, I'm then, happy to talk about... I'm wondering if you yeah, learned. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I know a lot of the older voting machines were very prone to somebody just opening up the panel and sticking a USB strip, wow. strip into the unlocked, completely open panel and hacking the OS of the machine. Are these new ones harder to do that with in your research? I have no idea. I, no, I did not look at the know. physical security. Yeah. I'm an election judge, okay? Um, I have, as an election judge, I have full access to all the paper ballots as an election judge. Mm -hmm. And I also have full access to that memory stick. Just so you know. <laughs> there you go. I can tell that we have a, you know, as always, we have awesome meet us. We have a very interesting audience with us tonight. Diverse knowledge. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so, yeah, that's my talk. I had not planned on it going over an hour. So we can change topics or we can call it a day or I can go grab a beer or whatever. <laughs> I mean, I guess <laughs> just... I, yeah, I mean, yeah, no, no need to keep everybody here till nine, you know, uh, if people, you know, that being said, uh, we're going to have another hour. I guess, um, I guess we might want to circle back to just seeing, since it is very relevant to the topic right now, if there are people, and I imagine given our audience that we probably have yeah. an audience that mostly <laughs> understands this, of, you know, if, is there anybody in this room who's like, hey, there's a pandemic going on, it really seems like online voting might be the answer to all our problems. Yeah. You've heard us saying, no, that's a terrible idea. Is there anybody oh. who doesn't get why it's a terrible idea and would like to talk about it more? So, well, I actually wanted to cover just like some basic fundamental stuff about some of the latest happenings with mail voting. Oh, that's um, it. If you don't that's mind right. to start. Maybe, unless we have okay, somebody so. who really wants to dig into what I just raised. Yes, I, by all means, if you feel that some of the recent happenings deserve some discussion, and yeah, there's a lot of happenings, and I work for a company in this space, and I frankly am not always up to date on the latest crazy scrambling going on. So yes, but please, if there's something you want us to all touch yeah. on, I'm happy to go there. Well, I could start yeah. if you'd like. In response to what you just asked about, um, the State League of Women Voters, I serve as their voting and elections issue chair and am the person who coordinates our uh, advocacy at the state level. We have positions that we operate under and they are all 10 years old. And so we're gonna be updating our main positions on voting and election equipment in the next uh, six months. And there had been a previous study in 2010 that talked about online voting. And mm -hmm. uh, there was no consensus that we would support that, even in 2010. But there was more interest then. I think that one of the things that we'll be able to do in our update will be to get into what I think you were probably going to get into is the details of why that's not a good idea. There's some place for it, perhaps. Um, there has been a pilot project in Bear County using it for people in uh, really isolated right. uh, military situations. But other than right. that, that's that's not interesting. 
Yeah. So, the vote by mail. Pardon? Go ahead. Uh, well, I had I actually had a, a thing on before we go to vote by mail. I had a thing on the uh, uh, a good analogy that I have found nowadays is that a lot of people are aware of the concept of you know Zoom bombing or crashing into web meetings, and mm -hmm. the reason why that's so possible is because anybody can access your meeting because it's on the internet. And so like somebody from another country can come in and bomb your meeting. And so online voting is the same concept where it's not localized to just your like Travis County or just your polling place or just your mail system. It can be accessed from anywhere in the world and try to and try to bomb it that way. And so Zoom bombing opens it's like so prevalent because anybody can do it. Online voting is susceptible to the same sort of risk. Yeah, I think that's a great analogy. And I and I guess I'll just I'll add a little further for say first, anybody who's really interested in the topic, there is a wonderful video by a YouTuber, a YouTuber named Travis Scott, who's a UK technologist, who really gives one of the best rundowns and clear, easy to understand language I've ever heard of why online voting, as much as we might want it to work is like almost technically impossible and and what and what i'll say is that you know to answer the other common question you hear people saying well i can bank online why can't i vote online the key answer is central points of failure there are billions and billions of banking transactions every day and they're very peer-to-peer -peer. they're between tons of different unrelated parties now, some of them do get hacked, tons of them every day, but there's no, but there's not like a few key points you attack and you destabilize the entire financial system. There's far fewer points of attack in an election. So it actually becomes something that doing like an attack at scale becomes economically feasible. So that's the quick and dirty why you can bank online, but not vote online. Basically, if, if somebody like claims, hey, I've solved online voting, um, and, you know, it'd be tempting to listen to somebody who says that in this current environment. I would love somebody to solve it. The key thing you need to be critical about asking about their solution is, has it removed the central point of failure problem? Has it somehow decentralized and peered to peered the recording of the votes in some way that it is now resistant to that problem? If the solution doesn't have an answer to that, that problem, it means they're probably selling you snake oil, unfortunately. Yeah, and to follow up on what you just said, the banks eat whatever they get stuck with. Mm -hmm. Your account mm -hmm. may be hacked, but the benefit that they get by you banking online, saved cashiers, save all sorts of savings, certainly overwhelms the money that they lose when something like that happens. If we were to do that, the loss would be someone's votes lost and we don't know how many exactly. no way to yeah. make up for that. yeah that's one of the key differences between things like financial transactions and voting is that there's no you can undo a financial transaction right maybe not if you're like on bitcoin or something like that but like if you get scammed and pay somebody on your credit card or whatever like you can do a chargeback or like there's ways of mitigating bad things happening if like voting has to be anonymous, otherwise you can uh, could like force people to vote your way or, or pay people to vote or whatever. Um, but like voting has to be anonymous, which means that the moment you get that ballot and you slide it into the scanner, that's your vote. And you cannot undo that. There is no undo in voting. And so that you can't if you fail in some online thing and a whole bunch of people cast ballots when they're not supposed to or a whole bunch of people like hack in and change people's votes or whatever like there's no way of being able to undo that and so you have to get it perfect or you have to get it right as close to right as possible and that's extremely hard to do in a digital space digital only space yeah and that but applies even to your absentee ballot you know you're ballot when you fill it out is placed in a sealed envelope inside the carrier envelope and they don't open that up until they've already certified everything and then it goes in anonymously just like your regular vote would 
That's the other thing I want to point out from these elections is that there are really two separate elections here being run by each county. One that by mail ballot, which would not, the barcodes wouldn't be the same as the in-person ones, I don't think. Uh, because you do see the check marks in that. And that's going to be, uh, we all think, a big, much bigger percentage of the vote than it has been. We hope. <laughs> we hope it is. Well, I mean, yeah, that's, I guess, if you want to move to the topic of mail, I think that it would be good to just give an overview of the current status of being able to vote by mail in Texas. Yeah, sure. I, I think uh, we, we'd love that if you could give us a quick rundown of where that stands right now. And I guess, you know, to sort of give like an EFF Austin position on it uh, to everybody in the room, you shouldn't necessarily think of it that like EFF Austin are like, like, oh, mail voting, greatest idea ever. It's more could be thought of as a, well, given everything going on, it is the least imperfect solution to all the problems we see going on right now. Because for the reasons right. just talked about, online voting is a total non-starter. So mail voting, you know, it it's it's the best solution I've heard given the constraints of everything going on right now. But yes, what what is so the current state? Right? By the attorneys, the League of Women Voters, and at both the state level and the Austin League, for the first time I, I've heard of ever got involved with intervening in the Democratic Party lawsuit, calling for the Democratic Party lawsuit did not, even though the attorney general keeps saying it, did not call for all male voting. Uh, there's been some discussion about that in Congress, but here in Texas, we were calling for the opportunity for people to use online voting if they felt their health was at risk. And where we stand as of today, and it could change, but I don't think it's gonna change now for uh, at least uh, before the July election is that Travis County did not appeal the uh, state district court ruling that said that anyone who felt their health was at risk. And the language in the election code says something like, and I don't have it in front of me because I didn't know I was going to talk about this. Uh, if you have an illness or a disability that going to the polls would uh, put you at further risk or would damage your health, I believe is the actual word. You are able to do that. So what our attorneys advised yesterday was there, at least in Travis County, anyone can use the vote by mail and, and claim the disability, but do not write in anything extra. The form's not made to receive anything extra, and there's no need whatsoever to put COVID-19. If you have a physical condition and you personally decide that that's going to put you at further risk or your health at further risk, you decide that. And there's no investigatory system in place to challenge that anyway. We have an attorney general who's trying to be a bully and try to scare people, but the real truth is that's not the case. Harris County has already taken that position as well. And I believe Dallas County has too, and Bear County was supposed to be doing that this week. So we were advised to suggest to people that they contact their county to find out each of those uh, positions not the clearest and we're hoping to get that cleared up but that's where we are as of today there's court hearings uh this week and friday on some other suits where uh i think it was the democratic party and some other folks involved who were claiming that uh, there was age discrimination based just on another constitutional approach to uh setting up the capability for those 65 and older to be able to vote absentee and that that was discriminatory to everybody else. What, I mean, what's the justification for that? So that's right. sort of where we are. Pretty open. Uh, and I think if you, I mentioned to Daniel, our biggest concern right now is there not being enough election workers. We want to provide the ballot, in-person ballot to anybody who wants to use it. But I mean, I did voter protection March 3rd. Jackie was actually working the elections. There were people who just didn't show up. And 
and polling places that either opened late or didn't open at all. And we've got to try to do our very best to try to get people in place. It's not going to be all those. I mean, everybody on this webinar who's ever voted has walked into a polling place and the age is not uh, outside of the vulnerable target group. Let's put it that way. As somebody who votes in every election, no, I don't think you'd be wrong in your uh, observation there that those who normally volunteer for this are unfortunately most at risk in the current situation. So I have a question. And they're not in it for the money, but there are a lot of people out of work. And uh, you do get, we now do have two full weeks of early voting. And I think they've, most of the counties have allowed people to do shift work for the early voting period. It's not a 4 a.m. to 11 p.m. day. Mm, so and there I, are so, and if you go on the website, there are some technical positions as well that some of the people in your uh, membership may want to look into uh, two levels of technical assistance. And they don't pay a lot of money, but they pay probably rent money if someone doesn't have a job or any kind yeah, of contracts where, underway. Where's the info on the current tech positions you guys need filled? So go to you have that handy? Yeah, let me yeah. let me bring it up right quick. I'm sharing my screen. <laughs> yes. Share that one yes. Yeah, sh share me David, uh, Dan I, if, if I can send you some qualified tech people to help out, I'd be happy to. So uh, let's take a look. Well, there's a whole application process online, and it describes the jobs and gives you the hourly. I think it's like fourteen or sixteen dollars an hour okay. for the tech so, folks. If you go to, if you just Google Travis County Clerk. Right. And go to the election section. There's a join the election team right. page, and that's where all of the postings are. Gotcha. There's a top list there. Uh, there's a ballot by mail clerk category, uh, a truck, new Field truck support driver. technician, senior support technician. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. yeah exactly. So, I, Cindy, I Got actually it. have a, a question on the absentee ballot stuff. Um, sure. If I apply for an absentee ballot and it doesn't come in the mail, we actually saw this in Wisconsin, it doesn't come in the mail, can I still mm -hmm. vote in person? Yes. Um, you are supposed to call, you know, that's, but that's a good question because we're very concerned that they're going to be overwhelmed, yeah. not have enough people to help them. Bill. And there is a uh, an allowance for being able to uh, call and verify that you haven't received it. Now, in other places that are set up around the country, there's a process that's similar to the way they track FedEx. They have a tracking system for when it leaves the county, when it gets to you, when you put it back in the mail, and when it's received, and when it's voted. But I don't know of anybody in Texas that has that system. There are also counties that have automated reading processes, uh, a lot of reader machines. And there are counties who turnkey the entire vote by mail process. Talking with the legislative uh, committee chair for the Texas election administrators, they in uh, Williamson County turnkeyed. The, I think the last two elections and one that turned out okay in the primary, he said it was sort of a shit show. Pardon my language. So there's not <laughs> a lot of experience with that because it hasn't been a high percentage. Um, I've done a really deep dive into vote by mail around the country and there's some really good work out there if anyone's interested in, in finding out more about how all those systems work. Our state's just going to be very challenged to try to deal with the situation. So is there a... But it's a pretty a good official, idea for how to do what you just said, posted yeah, on our website. Like a flow chart or something like that? If, if, what, I, what if this happens, what do I do? Uh-huh. 
because Which, there's so the much way, confusion and so much changing going on. It's really hard to understand what's going on. Yeah, well, just last yeah. night, Governor allowed us to lengthen the period. I will say the league has been very active in continuing to voice our request to the governor and to the secretary of state. And last night's uh, statement that he released and the changes to the early voting were some of those that we had requested. So that was good. We're happy to see that. I, I don't trust that they aren't gonna do that and then say, well, but we've already fulfilled all of this so we don't need any additional vote by mail, but we get what we can get when we can get it. So, but that's a really good idea. I think that, you know, our biggest problem is gonna be communications too. I mean, while we're gonna have a real issue in dealing with it, just having people know and understand the process who have never even thought about it. I mean, I'd never applied to vote by mail. I'd been able to do that for three years. So, um, and on my, it was not on my radar screen uh, to try to even consider turning our state into a mostly mail ballot state because we have one of the most suppressive uh, uh, leadership, state leaderships in place around the country. So. Well, it's very Our was confidence. We need to establish the confidence in the process too, and not not uh, sow any kind of discomfort with the process. Well, Texas makes these things difficult in general. I mean, one exactly. of the main things that Civitex Registered to Vote works on is um, you know helping people get registered to vote, which is way harder in Texas than it needs to be because of our wet signature requirements. And so you have the whole mailing people stuff, mm -hmm. you got to sign it and send it back thing. You know, you can't do it all online. Well, and we were part of those people that were working with the Secretary of State trying to make sure we could give people the ability to register online. And I think that our conversations did help with the Secretary of State Advisory promoting register to vote. Um, right. So that's, right. that's a good I mean, thing. But it's, it's a step right. on the right in the right direction. The other thing I've learned through the deep dive is signature confirmation. Uh, you know, the status, these really intricate arcane rules on checking the signature of the carrier envelope and your voter registration and all of this. And I find out in those states elsewhere that have online voter registration, that electronic signature is compared to those signatures that come in on the ballots electronically. So you've got the whole process set up to verify from, whereas all we have is that wet signature <laughs> that can change all the time. There's no reason it can't be done with digital signatures because the digital no. signature is, is cryptographically signed to verify its authenticity. I mean, people right. sign legal documents fully legally, entirely digitally right. now. There's That's no true. reason it can't be done. Just no, pull it's it cool. a good thing. I'm just saying it's a good thing we should be doing anyway, but it we've also found it has another benefit when everybody's questioning it it has a real benefit in making sure that the uh, absentee ballots are correct. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I, will, I will just say, you know, continue to be fans of everything the league does. I utilize the voter guide quite frequently. It, it's especially helpful with those very cryptic candidates that it's hard to find anything out about. So really appreciate all the work you guys do. Well, uh, I, I don't know if Jackie is still around, but that is 100% legwork on Jackie, Jackie's side to get a hold of those candidates and get them to fill out their damn profiles. Like it is, it is 100% calling people up and cajoling them to give us statements about that stuff. It is not an automated process. It is a manual process. There's a lot of like we have had we have had we have had candidates who don't have emails who don't have cell phones who like we have to like physically get them to write down things and then like send it back to us it's like and i always like i'm like why are you running for office if you are not willing to be contacted by people 
Like that's kind of the point, isn't it? Yeah, you'd think. I also like, you know, it, you know, there may a candidate like, you know, I can like some of the things I've researched on them, but then if I look at the lead guide and like, you know, they conspicuously are blank on every question they were asked, like we couldn't get an answer out of this person. It's always kind of a red flag of like every one of your opponents answered yeah. this. Why did you not answer? And it's not because they just didn't get the message. Like, follow-ups are done. Like, we jump all, all over ourselves to try to get a hold of them. And so if it says Canada didn't respond, it's because they didn't respond, not because we couldn't get a hold of them. Right. <laughs> well, and I guess, I guess, you know, we're probably, you know, can wrap it up here in a sec. I guess just one thing I, I finally like to maybe add is, like, is there... Um, you know, the, you already talked a bit about this, but as far as like the league's needs navigating like the craziest election since maybe even World War II, you know, I'm just like, what, what do you guys need to help you do your job, especially when it comes from like a, a technical or legal side? Because any help EFF Austin can provide you guys during this crazy time, we'd be happy to try to assist. I think the biggest thing that you might be able to assist with is communications. And I don't know what your wheelhouse is in, in terms of that, but um, we have when we're out. Influential reach with uh, connected people, you know, we certainly can get yeah. a message in useful places that might make things happen if need be. Being able to uplift all of the good solid information would be tremendous. Uh, I'd, I'm not sure if we have anyone on our team right now that knows how to um, really manipulate Google and the other uh, search engines to get you where you need to. I know in the past I've talked with young guys who are really into Reddit and the Reddit group was really helpful in spreading the word, especially to young guys. I don't know if that's a thing or not. I don't study that area. Austin well, subreddit is definitely still a thing for better and for worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, so but, actually uh, that, go ahead, sorry, Cindy. No, no, go on. Um, on the topic of tech topics, um, I would say that I want to throw in there that, like, the League of Women Voters is not all women. I'm here. So, right. like, it's not, please, well, yes, just like, not it's, all you, don't, you don't have to be a woman know, to join. Like, to <laughs> yeah, so please, if, it's not a scary organization to join. It's now been alive for over 100 years. And so, like, it's been around for over a century. So... It's not necessarily a, well, the one thing that I like try to keep in mind is since like we're, we've been following my, my attitude around it is the state elections and state voting moves at a certain technological pace that has not kept up with modern technology, right? Like yeah. ballot information, all of that sort of stuff. And so like it is always like we're constantly being pulled back by the technology of the system that we're trying to support and not necessarily that. And so being able to wrap that system, wrap that antiquated, like, uh, you know, either like in-person voting or convoluted forms filing or whatever, like wrapping that in modern technology, similar to kind of register to vote. I think there's a lot of opportunity for that. From well, well, you know, I guess I'll just say on that front, Daniel, if, if you after this would like to connect me via email with your uh, League of Women Voters colleagues here in the call and potentially anybody else is relevant who uh, we could continue this conversation and see about maybe connecting the League with, uh, you know, dedicated uh, activist hacker types who might be able to supply some of the needs here. Yeah. Well, thank you, because, you know, us women engineers can be used to being 10% of some population we're, the league is at least 10% male, and um, we <laughs> welcome you all. Yes. 
I, I, I feel welcome already. You don't need to concern me no, about that. I can tell it's a good group of people. <laughs> yeah. The other the other issue well, is. Yeah. That's it. Sorry. I was just going to say the hard to not talk to people in this call. Sorry. Getting applications <laughs> out to people who want them. You know, now you've got registered to vote for online voter registration, and we're pumping that out as often as we can, trying to promote that. We appreciate it. By the it. way, if you go to the League of Women Voters of Texas website, there is a lot of good information, and we really work hard to keep it up to date as of today. Like this morning, it was already up to date on the new early voting. Uh, but we don't have any kind of automated way for people to get their uh, ABBMs, the application for ballot by mail, because mm -hmm. you have to request it. They send you the application. You have to find an envelope or and a stamp. You send it back to them. And then when they send you the ballot, you have to have a stamp to send it back to them because we're not one of those easy to vote states. I so, see. So so unlike with registering to vote where there is a single round of having to deal with mailing something in, there is two rounds right. with the vote by mail. Two rounds and you have to have your own postage because Secretary of State claims that their uh, bulk mail postage that every county uses, the same bulk mail account, can't be used for anything but registration. Uh, we were really so approaching you can't this. Can't hire yeah. it the way registered to vote does because they claim mail somebody bulk mailing on people's behalf. Uh uh. Uh well, uh, it, they just I claim it can't be used for voting. It's used for registration. Yeah. Wow. Now, yeah. Other I states that do the <laughs> mail you the ballot. They include a postage paid return. Texas is not so. If someone could come up with a way to get that done, or I don't know how you, a, a nonprofit. The other thing we haven't said about the league is we are absolutely 100% totally nonpartisan. And that's why we never promoted register to vote until we got the Secretary of State to put it in their advisory, because we all know it's a democratic based system. I mean, there's no question about that. Oh, yeah. No, we I mean couldn't promote it. You know, it's yes, it's a nonpartisan tool, but it's obvious all the people who built it, what party they are. Right. And they've talked about that pretty widely and openly, and that's great. I don't have any problem with that. It's just the league is that's why we're able to talk with Secretary of State and request things, because we aren't partisan and we work with them really closely, closer than most of our other collaborators. Because we don't take a an attack version. Version uh, we we well, try to work with. The league's nonpartisanship is, is frankly quite impressive. It's like I read a lot of news sources and a lot of different interviews and slants on candidates and positions, and and the league really is about as nonpartisan as you get in its coverage of the candidates. So it's it, thank God somebody's right. doing it, and I, I think you're right. It often. I mean, EFF Austin, um, we we really try to be as nonpartisan as we can too. I mean, I think it's obvious the politics of most of the board, but we really do try to keep it neutral because we feel these issues affect everybody. And, you know, we actually have a lot of people more on the right of the libertarian slant that we have a lot of common ground on these issues with. So we really try to keep the focus mm -hmm. on what our advocacy is about and not uh, the personal preferences of the board. Right. So that doesn't mean that we don't have the head of the GOP telling all the candidates in the state not to be in the voters' guides. But well, you know, yeah, you know, it, it doesn't mean we don't have Mitch McConnell <laughs> trying to expand the Patriot well, Act again while nobody's watching. But you know, <laughs> so, to go back to the original kind of thing of like what what people need, I do want to plug the other organization that I. Um, fairly heavily involved in, which is Open Austin. Oh, yes. Um, and that is the uh, brigade. So the National Organization Code for America has local chapters, and Open Austin is the local chapter, the local brigade of uh, Code for America for Austin. And it has uh, regular meetups and various projects on not 
always voting topics, but coronavirus has been, uh, coronavirus local projects have been a very hot topic recently as well. And so, as well as housing projects and local community projects. And so I do want to th say that like, there is a thriving community, including the League of Women Voters and including EFF Austin and including uh, Open Austin of like code for good or or local engagement. And so I, awesome. I, ever since moving to Austin, I've always been continuously impressed at the um, leadership but by all of the various organizations, the league, Open Austin, like all that sort of stuff. Everybody's been fantastic in their passion, as well as as you, Kevin, in the in EFF. Like, is I've always been very inspired by the passion that everybody brings to these sort of things. So, kudos, oh, good job, everybody. High fives all around. Oh, well, you as well. <laughs> I continue. I mean, I I really continue to try to. We're blessed by how many uh, good orgs doing this work in this space are in town, and I can, I really one of my big efforts is try to make it where we all know each other exists and work more together. Because I'm like, wow, maybe if we combined all our numbers, we might actually get some stuff done. You know, there's a lot of us actually. So, but yeah, I, I really appreciate the work all our affiliate allied groups do. Um, but yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'm happy to follow up with the league via email after this and um, see what we can do as far as a partnership help. Um, yeah, um, I feel like we've mostly gone over everything germane to tonight's topic. I have a question. I don't mind letting people out a few minutes early. Somebody had a question. I do. Yes. Thanks, Daniel. Um, and Kevin, let me know if this is not if you want to facilitate, because this is not 100% germane. But Cindy, I'm wondering what, also on the topic of how we can pitch in as regular residents, on communication, what, um, can you elaborate on that a bit more? So you mentioned communication and outreach to more tech specific and sure. nerdy people. Everybody, in this room and everyone everywhere have intersecting circles of their influence and broadening information out to those circles in ways that they will be attentive to it. Uh, knowing your audience, I guess, is very helpful. Um, I, I did a lot of voter registration as a VDR too, and honestly, We've been around 100 years, but there are hundreds and thousands of people who don't have a clue about what we do, never heard of Vote 411, don't know what the voter's guide is, or maybe that's the only thing they know that we do. So one, membership. All of our membership is at three levels. We have, you become a member at the local league level, and then those local league members send people to the state level on a board of directors and to have appointed issue chairs to represent them in the uh, legislature. And then you're also part of the US League that provides a lot of information and actually provides the platform for one one. Um, so getting involved in the league period would be a big help, but taking the information that we provide and the state league does have information that's good for anywhere in the entire state. Um, but they have a, a, a Instagram, a, a Facebook, an active Twitter feed, uh, and any of those things that any of your organizations or any of you individually can help promote or uplift would be a big help, especially because information has been changing so rapidly this year. We had the same sort of situation when voter ID was implemented because it was implemented, then it got changed, then it was in the courts, and then it got changed, and people were just really, very confused about what to take to the polls with them. Now yeah. it's just, where are the polls going to be? How do I get my information? Uh, and, ha and can I be safe and secure when I get there? One of the other things announced is this federal money is going to all go to the counties for using uh, or for providing a safe environment, too. You know, all the face mask and the shields and the 
disinfectant and that sort of thing. So I don't know if that gives you an idea, but like we we have volunteers who've done little videos uh, that are on the le state league website. The local leagues really do all the local candidate work. And then the state league do, handles uh, statewide electives, all those people that are elected by everyone in the state. Got it. And there are well, lots of different ways you can plug in. We'd love to have you as a member or, or as a volunteer. <laughs> I mean, we're all volunteers, 100%. I, and, you know, I just uh, follow quickly, up. And, and I guess I'll just oh, quickly word off that reply real quick and just say, yeah, I, I think just ordinary promotion of people's causes is, is a great way to help. And then, and just, you know, to get on my own little soapbox that that goes for free of that Austin as well. One of the biggest ways you can help us is just let people know we're a thing. We're all volunteer driven, you know, so people are passionate about this stuff, get involved, volunteer. We're all community donation driven. So go on our website and give money to our PayPal. Every cent helps. Uh, and just, yeah, you know, let, let people know we're a thing, because, I mean, we've been around almost 30 years, and yet still the vast majority of Austin does not know we're a thing. Hell, the vast majority of the world does not know that EFF is a thing, you know, even though probably after the ACLU, they're the most famous activist org in this space, um, still tons of people don't know uh, who they are. And frankly, I think to this day, one of the most important things for the cause I ever did was when um, an organization here in town called Global Austin was hosting a uh, international State Department delegation that had reps mm -hmm. from like 30 different countries on a law-finding, fact-finding mission. All those people now know who EFF is and have taken that knowledge back to their own countries. So I really think that kind of work right there of just spreading the word can have some mm -hmm. of the biggest impact. Couldn't agree more. Follow-up question. You mentioned in the intersecting circles of knowing each other, and I really love the idea of leveraging, you know, it's mm -hmm. ordinary people that know other ordinary people, but do you see a, a risk in, how do I phrase this? In a risk in an echo chamber forming and that we may, with all good intentions, accidentally leave those that we don't know. So perhaps less socially advantaged people or people of different social stratas. Um, are we, might we accidentally? Well, those we, we purposely try to reach out to. We've got relationships established with all of the uh, major organizations and minor organizations that represent those uh, people of color and people of lesser means, those are sort of our target that we really have been trying to go after. And, and we're not doing just around voting, we're also trying to be uh, good promoters of uh, participation in the census as well. So we try to always combine messages there. That's where a lot of our volunteers have tried to, you know, we had lots of big plans too that were put on hold because of the, uh, the virus. Um, Lots of us were involved in outreach for voting and for census at, say, all the foundation community uh, residences, for instance. That was one I was involved in. A lot of uh, volunteer work around the census with, I want to say, the YMCA and some other folks in town, United Way. Um, so what we're trying to do is leverage everything we can in your particular bailiwick, and that's online. Um, but we're, even at the local league, we're doing a retro outreach as well. We've, years ago, before any of you were born, there was a thing called a telephone tree. And that's how people got information out to their members by a small group of members taking 10 or 20 members to call and let them know about things. And so we've resurrected that telephone tree and I've been calling especially our older members but there's some younger members on there as well just letting them know we're thinking about them and reminding them one of our annual meeting that's coming up this weekend but also about what's going on with voting and how the league's been involved in promoting vote by mail and just keeping them up to date so yeah it it can be at all levels of communications for sure whether it's 
developing a program that helps get more hits on the social media that we already have, or if it's giving phone calls to people that you just happen to know, or maybe you volunteer at an organization. We, we know by statistical information that especially those folks who are getting assistance from some nonprofit tend to uh, give more credence to what the people at the nonprofit tell them than to somebody like us. Um, there's a whole organization called a national organization, Nonprofit Votes, and they've done a lot of good research on that topic. We also know what to say and not what not to say. We never talk about voter fraud because <laughs> we know from technical research that everybody does think that the elections may be rigged. And it doesn't matter what category ge uh, geographically or demographically they fit in. So we are always trying to do our best to establish confidence in the system and common ideals and uh, understanding of what the democracy is and how it can be better if they're involved, how their lives can be better if they get involved. Mm -hmm. I could go on for two hours, so let's... <laughs> I think oh, that's yeah. probably don't, the don't, end. Don't get, don't get me on my soapbox. I'll join you too. <laughs> Thank you for that, both of you. We certainly welcome your involvement. Yeah. Um, for full disclosure, I am the lead or this nameless, faceless entity that's talking out of your screen right now, the lead organizer at Open Austin. And I'm always trying to get our membership to think outside how we can use tech to harken back to like old school social or civic mm -hmm. engagement because tech is not the only solution. Yeah, like one of the women I talked to today doesn't even have the internet. Doesn't I mean, have any smartphone. Uh, I mean, half of half of my jobs when I was with EFF Austin awesome is telling people who think tech solves everything of like, yeah, but it also causes <laughs> tons of new problems. I've got so many solutions to our crises that are like surveillance disasters that I'm just having to go, no, 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 stop it right now. <laughs> so, you know, it, uh, you know, but I know I'll just also say, uh, to the people with open Austin here, um, uh, definitely, uh, reach out to us anytime. If any of you want to speak to the meetup at some point uh, about a relevant topic, you know, we're always looking for speakers and we've been friends, uh, with open Austin for a long time, uh, you know, love Daniel and Mateo and, and everybody. So uh, definitely feel free to send something relevant our way. We'd be happy to have it hosted at the meetup. And if anybody wants to take over the project of creating the open source tool to generate the barcode reference cheat sheets that you can take into the election in November, let me know. Yeah, you know what I mean, Daniel, I'm, I'm frankly happy to ask around at my company and see if anybody has any ideas. It strikes me as the sort of tool that somebody in our space might know somebody who that piques their interest. You'll get so many upvotes on Hacker News. I know. They'll be like, hooray, and then they just all upvote and move on. <laughs> Well, and if you have brothers, sisters, just graduated from college, can't find a job, want to do something really interesting, get them to sign up to work the elections. Wear their masks. Be prepared to be safe. But it's and, definitely interesting and boring at the same time. I'm yeah, sure Jackie would agree. <laughs> you get to use the meme, the Starship Troopers meme, that's like, I'm doing my part. <laughs> That's right. Daniel, Daniel, thank you very much for doing the deep dive. Thank you yeah, all absolutely. for sticking it out to the end and I, appreciating you, me nerding out over barcodes for, well, thank for 45 you. We minutes. We haven't had one that, that went, went that deep into the technical nitty gritty on something in a while, so I appreciated that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, do we have any one last question from anybody that well, they want to get in before we adjourn here? Because we're down to the no. water. <laughs> I'm just on well, a roll yeah. at the end here. The I am hoping, hoping that Kevin and Cindy, you all can end with a short pithy call to action and Daniel too, just for everyone else that's on this call. 
I know I personally feel very trapped at home and isolated and also energized. So how can we, everyone, channel this energy? Um, well, I mean, I'll just say speaking for myself, I think a lot of the difficulty is suddenly finding a bunch of time I knew what to do with suddenly with nothing to do with it. But I think I'll, that can be viewed as an opportunity as well, that all those things you meant to do that you haven't had the time to do, suddenly you do now have the time to do it. So if you're a person who actually has always meant to try to get involved in the cause of fighting for digital civil liberties, for fighting for our rights, but life kept getting in the way, well, now might actually be the perfect time to start looking into that, especially if you're somebody privileged enough and lucky enough in this crisis that you still have your money and your job and your health. Because the people who don't have that are counting on you. Because uh, I guarantee you, the people who want to take our rights away, they're not letting this crisis go to waste. They're working right now. I already alluded to it, but I'm not joking that literally as we speak, Mitch McConnell is rushing through a reauthorization and expansion of the Patriot Act right now as we speak that would make it explicitly legal for the FBI to spy on every American search history online. Like, it would just say, uh, screw Fourth Amendment, it's legal. So it's even worse than the original act when we were finally about to sunset it here. He's using the distraction of this crisis, counting on that you're too beaten down and tired to not care. And, and so, I mean, really, it, you know, if we wanna go back to a world, ideally we want this crisis to end so we can go back to a world that is positive and one we love that for, where technology serves human beings and not the other way around. But we have to be vigilant during this crisis or you know, we maybe went through all this for what? We lost the things that really mattered. And what really matters ultimately at the end of the day is people. You know, All things are transitory, but at the end of the day, the things we really care about wanna preserve are our relationships with each other. And I always have passionately believed that that's what technology is to do, to help us serve people and serve those relationships, not the other way around. So I can't think of a better time to continue to fight for the reason that we're all alive. Was that inspiring and cheesy enough for everyone? Cindy, you're on mute. Cindy, you're on mute. It's hard to tell with this thing. Uh, I think I sort of started with my uh, elevator speech at the end, my last statement, and that is look at every opportunity you have to share this good information. I get a lot, uh, just like uh, was just Kevin had just been talking about, a lot of purpose in my life by feeling like I'm making a difference. And I'm not, I'm retired, so I get that all the time. But in these days, if you have that extra time, I would ask that you go to the League of Women Voters of Texas website and study that website and check out what's going on. We're, all, we're always open to questions and suggestions, just like Daniel suggested, what do I do if I don't get my ballot in time? We need to come up with the answers. We need to think about what the questions are people are going to ask. And all of you could be very helpful with that. But if you're doing, for instance, uh, happy hour in a Zoom or whatever your socialization is that's substituting for in-person, think about how you can work in some fun activity. You know, I talked with someone the other day who's doing postcards right now to remind all of her friends and neighbors to go and vote. Uh, there's all sorts of things that you, you know what you can do that I can't predict. You know, you know how you socialize and you know what your skills are. So if you're really great at putting together a, what's the little short film that, uh, a uh, TikTok or uh, things, things <laughs> that we're not gonna be doing or that we don't have yet, making it fun, making it easy, making it popular, um, and that that doesn't get forgotten and how important it is. 
mean, that's the main thing, I guess I would say. If you have any uh, any questions, ideas, suggestions, you can send me an email at Cindy, C-I-N-D-E, Weatherby, all at one, all one word, at Gmail. And I'll be happy to talk to you any way you'd like to talk. Thanks for asking. Yes, thank you for that. Thank you, Cindy. All right, and we last uh, one. I don't think that I have to go, right? I already did my 45 minutes on. <laughs> yeah, anyway, I, I, think, I think you've already inspired plenty. And we've got yeah. like, we've got we like. We did three. it, yay! We did it. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Daniel. Uh, you're always welcome back anytime. Any, keep bringing us fun stuff like that. Uh, it always is quite a fun time. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending. We will see you uh, next month, hopefully. Stop the recording.